Good. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the final talk during Nearfest 31, the final and best one, if I may say so myself. So uh, let's see, who do we have? How many guys have done park activations before? A few. How many guys have done field day before? A few more. How many have no idea about any of this and need to be entertained? How many have come in here to get out of the cold? All right, so this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about uh, parks on the air, park the expeditions. Not operating from home. Well, why don't you want to operate from home? Well, you're done operating from home. You're tired. You want to do something different. Or uh, you, you don't have much of a shack or much of an antenna. You live in an apartment house, condo, or whatever, and you want to go out and explore the great woods. These are all different reasons why you do this. Now, the type of park activations I'm going to talk about are real kick butt, get down and dirty type activations, not this business where you drive to the park with your mobile radio with two watts and you work two people and it's a oh, oh lucky day. Uh, everyone does that. That's not what we're going to talk about. So a little history. This whole business started in 2016 with an event that the league ran called National Parks on the Air. And uh, basically, the idea was for Hamza to run around and go to national parks or national monuments and activate them, put them on the air. And um, it, it was a tremendous success. So W1NVT, that's uh, the call sign of my club in northern Vermont. Uh, our goal was to put on a maximum effort from each park. We're on all afternoon, we're running big antennas, we're running power, and we started We started rather late because I thought the whole thing was silly because every time I saw someone doing a park activation, I'd see them on, spotted on the cluster, I couldn't hear them. Where'd they go, right? I mean, I should hear them, I didn't hear them. I said, well, you know, we're going to do it so people can actually hear us. So we waited till August of that year and we went to a place called the Missisquoi National Wild River. You basically go to a park alongside this river and that counted and it was up by Richford two baby steps from the Canadian border. So, I mean, we kind of stepped two steps this way, and we're signing VE2. And, and we didn't know exactly what we were doing. We set up three stations. Uh, we had a 40, a separate 40, a separate 20, and a six-meter station. Six-meter station didn't do squat, really. But we banged out 677 CUSOs in an afternoon. Not, not too shabby, right? We actually came back on uh, December 11th. It was right at the end of the program, and we wanted to help put them over a million CUSOs. So on December 11th, the, um, it was 11 degrees out, according to my thermometer in my car. And we're, we're there stringing dipoles and sitting in cars calling CQ. I mean, uh, sanity is not a necessarily a requirement for this, okay? Uh, but we, we did contribute to the million CUSOs. And then uh, in October 16th of that year, Right after Deerfield, we went to the Lamprey National Wild River. Basically, if you go to the end of the flea market, you see there's a little river down there. All the way down the other end, that's the Lamprey River. You go 10 miles that way towards West Epping, that's where we were set up. And I'll show you a picture of that. So we, we packed our stuff out of here, went down the street, and started CQing. So that, that's what Lamprey looks like. That's, that's Paul AA1SU. Uh, the river's right you know, back of them there to the side of them. And we're just on a card table. We got the, uh, the K3, a uh, big tuner, and you don't see the amplifier on the floor. And then this is Bob, KB1FRW. He's just a couple hundred feet away, and uh, he color coordinated his hat to match the foliage, which made it nice for the picture. And we borrowed the amp and the radio from, um, from another friend of us we know. We knew. It's a big amp, you know. You're, running about 500 watts there on 40 meters. This was the one uh, at Richford in December. You can see I'm all bundled up, and I'm in the back of uh, Bob's Toyota with this makeshift table, whatever. Uh, was it comfortable? No, it wasn't. Comfort is, you know, <laughs> you don't do that. And we had a, a couple of heaters running in that car to keep warm. We had a separate generator just for the heating systems. <laughs> okay, and when it's 11 degrees, you can't really stand it for too long. And then we got all the cars. You know, it gets dark at four o'clock in Vermont in December. We uh, got all the cars and flashed the headlights so we could see what we were doing to get out of there. So that was the end of that. Then, um, well, no, in that same year, I also did uh, what's called urban activations under my own call sign, 
when I'd go down to New York for various reasons, family or whatever, I, I would put some of the New York City parks on the air or the monuments. And now this uh, takes quite a bit of thinking how to do this. And my attitude was no park is created where I couldn't put up a good antenna. And by good antenna, I don't mean buddy poles. I don't mean hustlers. I certainly don't mean mag loops. Mag lo I bought a mag loop for a thousand bucks and it worked almost as good as my vertical. Huh? <laughs> no, almost as good as an antenna that radiates equally poorly. No, no, no. I, I don't believe in compromised antennas. Um, you know, life's too short for QRP, so I'm running power. So I did one at the Stonewall National Monument on Labor Day. Now, one thing you can do if you're doing this in New York City is you have to do it on a Saturday or Sunday. There's no way you're going to find a parking spot. And I, there's no way I'm putting all my stuff in a backpack and taking the subway. Eh, not doing that. That's not my thing, right? And... Um, Stonewall National Monument, they, they had some sort of riot there. They, they actually busted, they sh the city shut down it because it was a gay bar. And that wasn't cool back in the 60s, and it was a whole big thing. So now they celebrate it as a national monument. I didn't care. I just wanted to activate it. <laughs> I don't care about the politics, right? And, and then I did the, the Teddy Roosevelt, uh, where he was born. He's on a brownstone on 21st Street. And I did the federal building. Um, so let's see what that looks like. This is a, the stone wall. Uh, the stone wall is that white building with all the flags in front of it, and the dipole is running uh, about 15 feet above the ground in Christopher Park. So the whole park and the streets around it are considered the national monument. I tried to get on the roof of that building. They said, no, no, you can't really get up there. So I just kind of strung this. And I had to shoot the end of the wire over a tree, but I had to wait for the light to turn red. Otherwise, it'd be throwing the rock over people's heads and into traffic. So... It was, there was some logistics involved. We normally have a compressed air launcher to do this, but there's like no way I want to fire this cannon in the middle of a city. People would tend to freak, so I just kind of throwing rocks over things. And, and it was good. I was in the park, and my battery died after about the first 15 QSOs, so I just went in the car across the street, ran the cable across the street. And someone says, is that legal? I says, I don't know. The cop ran over it five times with his patrol car, so I guess he was okay with it. And, and I sat there working people uh, with this thing, and it was, it was very windy that day. And the, um, the antenna fell down. I look out, and I see this woman all tangled up in the wires. I said, hold on, hold on, we have a situation. I had to kind of rescue her, put the antenna back up, and I was back on it. made a couple hundred contacts doing that. This is the Teddy Roosevelt. This is a... so. You've got to understand, in New York, when radio waves, we call it concrete canyons. Okay, the streets run basically northwest to southeast, which is not any useful direction for ham radio. The, the buildings are 10 to 15 stories high in the street, and the sidewalk is about 50 feet wide. We're talking about a pipe, literally, that goes in not in the direction you want to work. So you have to work people through the building. But I did get them to let me up on the fourth floor. Can I drop this wire out of the fourth floor? I did it in this L-shaped thing that coming down from the fourth floor and then goes horizontal. Had to keep people from touching it, whatever. And the noise level was about S9 on 40 meters, and that's when it was good. That, that was a CW operation. You couldn't copy anyone on phone. And basically, the th character I sent most was question mark because couldn't hear people. I kept have to repeat and repeat. But I, I got 100 QSOs in the log, but uh, had to work really at it. And yeah, I was sitting right by that green door. And this is in the Gramercy Park section of Manhattan. This is like a ritzy, well-to-do place. And, and women are getting out of cabs wearing fur coats and heels and whatever and going around. And there I am sitting there scrunched up on the, on the stoop going uh, CQ and all that stuff. It, you got to love it. This is about what's said to be my craziest operation ever. This is, um, that building there with the portals there to the right, that is, uh, you know what that is? That's the stock exchange. Okay, I am sitting at the federal building. That's the, that's the statue of George Washington. And you see that, that uh, dipole sticking out of his butt? I put that there. So I had a full 40 meter dipole going across the front of the federal building. Uh, here's a better look at it. That, that's uh, Pete, K0BAK, who I did that with. And uh, you can see right there, there's the dipole there in back of George Washington. People are sitting there taking pictures of it. Oh, look, George has a dipole coming out of his head and whatever. And the, uh, the, the dipole ran between these, these portals. You know, it was a full 40-meter dipole. 40-story buildings all around us. 
And, and Pete, he had a ham stick on 20 meters. He, we worked a few people with it. I was mostly on CW and banged out 250 CUSOs. Now, the logistics of it, first of all, where are you going to park? Wall Street's closed to vehicular traffic. It's a pedestrian mall. You had to find a place to park. You had to wheel the equipment over because it was a block or two away. And then the thing that most people don't consider, where do you go to the bathroom? Big deal in Manhattan, right? And we, we, we located, and we actually did reconnaissance on this place and found a drugstore where they had a bathroom where we can go. And it's a good thing because it was the day after Christmas, no, the day before Christmas, it was raining, it was 32 degrees, it was uh, terrible weather. <laughs> and even though we were in out of the rain, here's what it looked like from the operations thing. I'm sitting on the cold cement there and I'm sending CQ or with my straight key. And uh, that blue thing is P Peter's um, LIFO battery, lithium ferrous oxide, right? And got the little radio here and this computer right here is, is sitting there. The problem is, I, I'm going to tell you, is that make sure you bring extra batteries to run the computer because when the computer battery died, um, we were all done. And I told Pete, well, I can go back to the car and get some paper. He said, forget it. Let's go home. I'm cold. He said it took him two days to dry all this stuff out. So <laughs> at any rate, uh, we had a lot of fun, fun doing that. And, and we did it in places that they said it couldn't be done. So in 2017, K1BIF, Bob Zahra, he created something called Vermont Parks on the Air. So now what we're going to do is put all the Vermont State Parks on the Air, all 59 of them. And he coordinated the activity with the Vermont State Parks Group. And we partnered with the Worldwide Flora and Fauna, WWFF, who was running a Parks on the Air program at that time. And so each park that they recognized, which was mostly state parks, um, national parks and state parks, they got a specific KFF four-digit number. Uh, and, and most DX operators support this group. So you get on from a park, you give that number out there, and people then click it off, and they collect parks or whatever and get all sorts of certificates. Then they had another group called the Parks on the Air, POTA. They broke away. They were mostly stateside. You know, they've included a few other countries now. And they just have the K and the four numbers. It, the K and the four numbers is easy. It's less letters to send, but whatever. But the problem is the two groups don't get along. This group hates that group. I don't want to talk to them. You, and what it means is some parks have different numbers, so that you got all this confusion going on. And we have to upload an ADF file to their, their thing. That's how people get credit. And the ADIFs, uh, the logs, have to be formatted differently, which now makes a whole headache for me, the uploader. Uh, and so we work a lot of DX stations. Some of our park activations, we work as many DX stations as stateside, so we want to support both of them. And I got to deal with all this politics. Says, Guys, we just want to talk to people. You have, you know, I'll give you match revolvers. Go work it out in a side room somewhere. Just leave me out of this. But um, unfortunately, that's what it is. And to give you a, how, an idea how bad it is, I did this talk last year, and I posted it on the Parks on the Air Facebook site, and he took it down. Well, you mentioned the other guys. I said, well, yeah, of course I mentioned the other guys. They're active in it, too, you know, I mean, really. But uh, unfortunate, but that's the way it goes. So anyway, getting around the politics and talking about the activations. The problem with most activations are the activators can't be heard by a lot of people. Um, the, the programs give you credit for going to a lot of parks. And all you need to do is work 10 guys. And it counts as an activation. Well, you work basically the 10 guys with the biggest and strongest antennas in the world. And the guys with regular dipoles, they can't even hear them half the time. So it's on the cost of minimal activation. The guys will do like 10 activations in an afternoon. But I mean, what are you doing? It's, it's kind of like a quantity and not quality. Uh, the other thing is the bands are changing. So what conditions are like at noon are quite a bit different than what conditions are like at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We see this all the time, where there's certain people we can't work now, but it says, hang on there a few hours, you, you'll hear us later, and that happens. Um, poor, inefficient antenna. So, you know, something on your car and with coils in it, that's not a very good antenna. Yeah, I, I have those kind of antennas, too, when I'm driving, but, uh, you know, for something where you want to work as many people as possible, it doesn't work that well. And, and, you know, then you have QRP, which means, you know, conditions haven't been all that great for the last few years. Uh, that's tough. Also, poor choice of bands and modes. You, you want to be on the bands that will produce the most number of contacts. And then some guys will not call CQ. They'll just kind of look around for people. 
Well, if you're looking around for other people, they can't find you. It's trying to find a, a rabbit running and hiding the whole time. So, so that's a problem, too. And so what ends up happening is the guys with the big antennas will work the park, and the guys with regular antennas, that they need not apply. So this is how we do it to get away from this. We, we typically will go with two stations, two stations simultaneously, a 20 and a 40. And the antennas are a dipole 50 feet. In the air, a dipole, that's it. 468 over F, not that hard to do. Uh, we often will feed it with open wire line so it makes it multi band. And we do our homework to make sure that where we go, there are big trees to put the antenna up into. That's the important piece. So I did this talk at Dayton, and the guy said, Well, in Michigan, they don't allow us to shoot antennas into trees. Now, I don't know if that's true, and frankly, I don't know why that would be an issue. I say, that sounds like to me a simple solution. What's that? Move. I can't think of any reason to live in Michigan anyway. Be, you know, and now he can't even put antennas in the trees. I mean, yeah, again, I don't know, but I mean, uh, we, we've talked to the park people in Vermont, and they don't have a problem. You know, they said, don't wreck the tree. Yeah, we know that, but they, they, they're pretty supportive of it. So when we put our antennas up, we have to be careful how we orient them so the 20 meter station doesn't bother the 40 meter station and vice versa. And we have uh, compressed air launchers where we, uh, we put compressed air in there and that thing will shoot a tennis ball with weight in it basically 60, 70 feet into the tree and around. You got to be careful. If you don't aim the thing right, you'll end up shooting it into the next county. So you got to know what you're doing and there's certainly a, a safety factor in there. Uh, so with uh, we get like small amplifiers like uh, an SB200 or the uh, the small Elecraft uh, KPA 500, 500 watts out. 500 watts out makes a big difference over 100 watts. That's like a little over an S unit. That that if you're in the noise, all of a sudden you won't be in the noise anymore. That's the big thing. You want to have band presence. You want people to come to you, find you. Um, now sometimes uh, this all last summer. 20, stunk, I couldn't work anybody. Uh, it was really awful, so I had to go on CW when I was on 20 meters. That got true, I was working a lot of Europeans. Phone, not enough signal there. I can do that, some people cannot do that. Uh, and we typically will start about 10, 11 in the morning and go till about five or so in the afternoon. I'm, I'm usually the last one off, the other guys are taking down, say, come on, we gotta go home, we gotta eat, you know. Old guys, eating and sleeping, priority, everything else secondary. <laughs> so, but it allows propagation cycles, you know, particularly if you work in the West Coast. Remember, at 10 in the morning, in the West Coast at 7 in the morning, propagation ain't so good on 20 meters at 7 in the morning in the West Coast, right? So uh, later in the day, it's better for them. And, and we'll typically work 400 to 800 cues. So when we're working 400, the band stinks. We would typically more like uh, between six to 800 cues, and, and we're working a lot of DX stations. And anyone with a halfway decent station, is, is, if you can't work us, you ain't trying too hard. Because we're there all day, you're gonna find us. So you wanna do this, you wanna do an activation, how do you do it? It's not that hard. The first thing is you gotta pick your park. Um, but be sure you're in a recognized park. You know, go, go to the, uh, the sites, the different programs, Look up the park, look where it is, what the number is, and make sure you're in the park, actually. Uh, we had one called Smuggler's, uh, Smuggler's Notch Stage Park. You couldn't go into the campground section because there's no room for us, but the park actually included a pullout up the road somewhere, so we went there. So you, ha you have to do a, a bit of homework to see where these things are. And um, you get on Google Earth and actually see the park from the sky, see where the trees are, see where the car has to be. See how to get there. I mean, it's kind of stupid to spend three hours getting lost finding the park, right? So you, you, you want to really have all this stuff in, in, in the plan. And if you can, do reconnaissance. You know, if, if you like find yourself there maybe a few months before, actually go in there and check it out. That's, that's the best thing you can do. Uh, the, the homework pays dividends. And um, I always say strive to do one park per day. Give, give it justice. Don't do this uh, hit and run thing, you, you know. <laughs> drive-by park activation type of stuff. Know your setup time. I mean, if you're spending half the day setting your stuff up, that's not good. And by setup time, meaning less than an hour. You know, less than an hour to get your antenna up, get your station put together, and get on the air. 
Okay, and, and you get good at it. You know what to do, what not to do. Uh, have a plan for lunch. That's something I sometimes forget. Oh, crap, I didn't bring anything. You know, now you're foraging for food or grass or whatever to eat. There's nothing to eat there. Um, that, that's, like, not fun. Uh, then you pre-announce the activity. So you go to the various park sites and you say, I'm going to be in this park at this time, these frequencies. Um, you know, let, let people know ahead of time, and carefully pack the night before. Um, and, and I can't stress how important this is, because the activation is pretty much over if you didn't bring the power cable, all right? I mean, that kind of stuff. So uh, you, you want to make sure you got all that. Um, for field day, something very serious, I actually build the station in my living room, pull everything out of the shack, and make sure the station's functional. If you're missing something like a power cable or a jumper or something, it becomes very obvious right away because you, you don't want to get on site and then find you're missing a key thing. So I, I run a checklist much like this. This this is the kind of things we bring, you know, the radio, the power cord, uh, the multi-strip, you know, for the AC, to plug different things in, 12-volt power supply, maybe a backup power supply, you know, things go bump in the night. Uh, we have an amplifier and a keying line for it, the tuner, the watt meter, you know, the... All the stuff here you need. Uh, no, notice this one here, headphones. You know, I have an exclamation point. So uh, the one we did here in Lamprey, Bob didn't bring headphones. <laughs> and he's, he's doing this the whole day, right? The other one, and the guy uploaded this to YouTube, which was kind of silly. He did a, an activation um, at one of the national parks in New Hampshire. And it's a little QRP thing with a little wire, you know, like maybe a couple of people heard him. And he gets on there, and a whole bunch of local school, all these school buses show up, and all these girls are having lunch around him, and all chattering and making noise, and he couldn't hear crap. He said, oh, crap, I didn't bring headphones. Why not? And he's trying to do this and strain to hear. And then the girls go away. Okay, good. Now I can do some operating. And as soon as he said that, the lawnmowers came out, and that kind of blacked him out. All right, fine. He learned, but he actually posted this to YouTube. He says, I wouldn't have posted that. It kind of makes you look kind of like, well, dumb. <laughs> but but it, you know, you should watch that and you, you get an appreciation bringing something which seems so trivial, it, it literally killed them. Uh, you know, so we, we run off of generators, so we have to bring generator. You have to bring sufficient gas. I didn't gas up the generator once, and so we were struggling to keep that running. Um, and spares of things. So uh, we have, I have a list for this for every aspect of my life. I can't go walk down the street without a checklist for what I need to bring because I can't remember nothing anymore. So way to actually operate. Well, you can set up on a picnic table or your own table. Just set up in the park. You're on a picnic table. Oh, look, that's nice. I have radio in the park. Well, the problem is if you're in New England, the weather kind of sucks. I mean, even though the weatherman will assure you it's not going to rain, it's probably going to rain or kind of drizzle. And, and I don't want my K3 rained on. I certainly don't want my amplifier rained on with the 3,000 volt, and that's just not good. So uh, I rarely set up in the outside unless I am really sure um, it's going to be nice out. And I've been burned a few times, so I, I'm very reluctant to do this. Uh, set up in an existing shelter if there's, if there's a shelter in the park, and it's okay for you to use it, perfect. Just bring your stuff in there, set up on a picnic table. Or you could set up a tent or a canopy, either a tent or, or a dining fly. Well, the problem is that takes a finite amount of time to set up. If it takes a half hour, that's a half hour that you're not operating, right? So, uh, and then you got to put it away at the end of the day, too. So th there's time involved there. Or you can operate from the inside of your van or your car, like I do. Um, and it can vary from comfortable to painful. So I, I got a minivan, I put a table in the back there, put the things in on the back seat, and hey, I can sit in there for hours, not a problem. Um, other people do it in the front seat of a Prius. That's, that's cruel and unusual torture. <laughs> I've done it for a while in his car, and uh, yeah, you kind of like that. He, he can only do it for about 40 minutes, and gets to get up, he's in intense pain. So uh, you, you have to kind of look at that, what, what you're physically capable of doing. So this is the car setup. <laughs> where you got the radio in the center thing there, and uh, you got the laptop literally on your lap, so you're not in a good position to type and whatever, and it's cramped. Uh, you, you do this if you can't do anything else. 
this is the old picnic table in the park. Uh, that's uh, Carl AB1DD. This is Waterbury State Park. Yeah, it's nice and comfortable. He's sitting there lounging back, running the pile up and whatever. But again, you know, if it rains, he, he's, he's a sitting duck. Uh, this is Bob K1BIF uh, in a different park with the same type of setup. Uh, here's my set. This is one of the few times they went outside. They got the amplifier, the tuner, the whole thing. Out there. We're ready to do war. And um, this is at um, Camp Kilcare State Park in Vermont. That's Lake Champlain there off to the right. So if you're outside, you can get some beautiful views. But when the wind starts kicking up, as it often does at this park, it starts blowing paper around. It starts blowing laptops around. So you, you got to be on top of that. And this is in Bob's uh, Vanagon, one of those bop up uh, uh, VW things there. Uh, th this isn't too bad in, from in there. And this is what my van looks like. So that's the table, whatever. I'm just sitting there. I got the amplifier. I got the computer, whatever. Uh, this is a night shot of what it looks like from, from my viewpoint. So I can see everything there. Uh, it, it's pretty easy to operate. This scene was taken. This, this was a park activation that didn't count. This, this was Burlington City Hall Park, not a park number. And this was done to show off ham radio to normal people. And we painfully learned that normal people are not interested in becoming hams. We have to show off ham radio to not normal people, and then we get a lot of people. We actually got two hams out of this, actually. It wasn't too bad, but you see a lot of people around, whatever, and most of the people are interested in eating, procuring and eating food as opposed to watching us get on the air. But we had a smaller setup. We had a nice boom microphone. You know, we made it good. Uh, we, got, we got some of our wives to operate, so, you know, Instead of having an old bald guy there, we, <laughs> we had a little bit better visual thing going on. And, and this was a, a, a um, Alice State Park, Bear Mountain. And we made very good use of that fire tower. You probably can't see it in the thing there, but we had a dipole running off. That thing's 60 feet high. We had a dipole running off that thing. And uh, we kicked butt from there. Uh, I think 900 QSOs or something like that. So antennas, don't skip, don't skimp on the antenna. Really, that is the most important part of the operation. Uh, a dipole 50 feet up works wonders. How good does a dipole work? My dipole at home, my dipole at 65 feet beats my Yagi at 50 feet to the west coast. Height is really, really important. Well, why does it do that? And we've modeled it, and because the takeoff angle on a higher antenna is much better, and it actually gives you a little bit more gain over the Yagi, believe it or not. So uh, you don't want to set Yaggies up in the park. It's a lot of work and whatever. Get the dipole up really high, and it will do wonders for you. And it says we got those launchers, which I'll show you here in a minute. We can get that over the highest trees. So you really want to support uh, both 20 and 40 meters, and I'll tell you that why in a minute. Uh, so you want to scout the area, where are the trees, you want to find high trees and you want to find an area accessible. If it's all trees, you can't put the antenna up. You'll just get locked up in the trees, right? You, you need an open area like a parking lot and trees around it and an area you can get behind the tree to secure the line. So we know what to look like, you know, look for. We can go over there in five minutes, survey the thing, know where we can shoot our lines. If, if you're running multiple stations, you want to be you know, several hundred feet apart so one guy doesn't talk to the other. Uh, you keep the dipoles broadside the key area. So not so much on 40, but on 20, you, you kind of want to run the thing broadside east-west because that antenna will have a, a little bit of uh, gain off the broadside. And uh, the best thing is multi-band antennas. So that way people can go on different bands. You can use a dipole on any band as long as it's a half wavelength if you feed it with open wire line. But that does mean you need a tuner and a ballon and all that other stuff, and we, we have those things. So I have a foolproof method, um, you know, compressed air, bow and arrow, slingshot. I mean, they all work, but whatever it is, be really good with your instrument. Know how to shoot that, get that ball over the tree on the first shot. Um, and particularly with the compressed air thing, you got to be aware of everyone in that park and where every car is because you don't. We use a weighted tennis ball that weighs eight ounces. You don't want to plunk anyone on the head with it. That's not going to be a good thing. And if that thing comes out and hits somebody's windshield, that may be a very good. You'll either put a dent in the car, or crack the windshield. So you want to know where that ball is going, you know, and that's why we use spotters and everything to make sure that we we don't have that problem. 
Um, so use a good manual tuner. Uh, you don't know, have to worry about the SWR. And I say manual tuner, leave the, the auto tuner crap at home. Uh, I've seen auto tuners at multiple operation stations. First of all, how lazy can you be you can't twiddle a few knobs? That's the first question. The second thing is auto tuners react to RF, so somebody in another band can freak out the auto tuner. I've seen this way too many times. I said, do that at home. You, you, you know, be a man, be a ham, <laughs> sit there and twiddle your own capacitors, whatever. It's not that hard to do. Uh, and of course, you also have to talk to the wherever you're going, make sure that they're cool with what you're going to do. That the, you know they're not, they're not going to have a cow and they see you shooting this compressed air thing over a tree or whatever. Uh, uh, probably shouldn't do it in front of uh, anyone who's a green leaf tree hugger. You know, when he's naturalist, oh my God, you knocked the leaf out of the tree. <laughs> Horrors. <laughs> Best they don't see that, but I mean, yeah, it doesn't really harm the trees. So that's our launcher. This was built by Bob. It basically this section here we fill with compressed air. Um, Usually 35 pounds per square inch. There's our little uh, our little gizmo there that tells us how much air is in there, and the ball sits in the bottom of this. And we push the button here, it pushes the air in there, and that thing comes flying out of here like a cannon. And safety is paramount. You don't want to point that thing at any one or anything that can be hurt because that ball's coming out of there at a very high rate of speed, and, and it will hurt. Here is the launcher being used. You, you got to aim it, and that little uh, spinning reel there, that's to bring the line back. You put it over the tree, the ball lands on the other side, you hook the wire to it, bring it back over. All right, so what do you, how are you going to do to power this thing? Well, for high power, um, use a small generator. We use, use a, a Honda 2000i. Right, not, not a problem. It's light, quiet, and efficient. Uh, you want to keep the generator at least 50 to 100 feet away from you so you don't hear it. And also, those generators tend to make RF noises sometimes. So, um, so if you put a line on there and put an RF filter on there, you can do that. Do we have an unmuted mic? Yeah, j just mute them. How come I have host? That's weird. No. Do I have to come out of share? I want the participants. That's right. Mute all. Gone. Well, I don't, I'm not using my mic here. I keep this muted. All right. Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, th there is some problems with the generator making electrical noise uh, when those Hondas there. Uh, so I find that 25 feet, you'll get noise. If you use it 50 to 100 feet, that usually quiets it down quite a bit. Uh, some parks don't allow generators at certain times, particularly camping parks, because the generators make noise and it bothers other campers. Now, the Honda will never make enough noise to bother anyone. That you get 100 feet away from, you don't hear it anymore, it goes away. However, if you have a camper running an old Coleman, my God, it shakes the whole earth and the trees and everything. That's why they have those rules. So, you know, we sit down with the ranger, uh, you know, if they don't want us to run the generator. Hey, look, can you put us in a spot where we can plug in? Yeah, sure, not a problem. It's problem solved. So, you, you know, you want to sit down and just have a chat with them, make sure everyone's online with this. Um, you can use your car electrical system, but boy, be real, real careful with this. Uh, when I do that, I've done that in a couple of activations. I'm not running the amp, I'm just running the 100 watts. I got the voltmeter on the line the whole time, and when I see that thing hit 12.0, I start the car up, because I don't want to get stranded in God knows where, right? Um, I don't, I don't like running that way. It freaks me out too much. I used to have a car that you'd look at it cockeyed, the battery would go dead, and it always had to get jumped by somebody. 
You can get a battery, you get these high efficiency LIFO batteries for 100 watts. They're really good, but God, they are so expensive, and they're probably even more expensive since the time I wrote this because you can't get lithium too easily. All right, so there's the Honda 2000. Yeah. Thing weighs all 53 pounds, just carry it to where you are. Just make sure you put enough, you put enough gas in there, you fill the tank, and it'll run nine hours. Not a problem. Now, logging, uh, you, you got a log, right? You're working hundreds of people, you got to keep a log. Don't even think of paper logging. I worked with some guy in some park in Florida. Well, we can't get to it yet. We got to go home. We got to transpose the log. What are you, nuts? You're going to write it down, then you're going to type it in the computer? No, no, no. We don't, we don't do that. First of all, I can't read my own handwriting anyway. And I dare say that probably a lot of people fit in that category. Yeah, it, it's inaccurate. Paper logs can get lost. I mean, I did once find myself logging on the back of a road map because my battery had died in the computer, so I was scribbling on the back. It's still on my glove box somewhere. I still see the log from one of the parks. Uh, you know what I do. You want to use a reliable computer logging system, uh, set up the computer so it's comfortable to use, and make sure you have a backup battery because the battery in this computer is only going to last. Um, in fact, I've got to make sure my battery is running here. It's only going to last maybe an hour or so, uh, old battery, whatever. Um, even have a backup computer, that sometimes makes a lot of sense. And, and make sure your software can generate, first of all, the ADIF file. That's what gets uploaded to the various park logs. That's also what gets loaded to Logbook of the World. So you need that, but you also want to have a Cabrillo file for paper log checking. Someone sends you a QSL card, that's easier to use that than to use an ADIF, which is best read by software instead of humans. Use a competitive radio. So uh, I have a choice. I can use my K3, but sometimes I don't want to take it out to a kind of a squirrely place where it might get messed up. I also have a DX70, an old Alenco. There's a big difference between those radios. The Alenco doesn't have the filtering and, and the stuff that I have on the K3. So um, if I, I'll, I'll make contacts with the DX70, but it would be a lot harder to do that. Uh, the 500 watt amp level is the best. You get a lot of ohms. It's easy to set up an amp, you know, if you have power to run it. Um, and the SP200 is an old tube type amp, so the generator gets a workout. Absolutely. <laughs> that thing's pulling uh, 10 amps uh, on, on keys. So does the amplifier matter? You bet it certainly does. There is a difference there. It brings you up over an S unit. Um, and like I said, it maintains band presence. Somebody tuning across the band, they hear you, they're going to go there. Particularly now with everyone on FT8, if you're there and you're the only one calling CQ, you suck them in like a magnet. That's really important if you want to work a lot of people. So single sideband is usually your focus. That's uh, the band that people can use the most. Uh, but there are other modes you need to have ready. Uh, go to CW. If Phone's not getting it done. You're calling CQ, CQ on, we had the amp, we had the high antenna, we're calling CQ on 20 meters, we're not getting answers. Everything's working, except the propagation isn't. So therefore, be ready, willing, and able to go on CW. Oh, I don't know CW. Well, for crying out loud, learn it. You know, if you don't know, how many don't know CW? Okay, so, if you don't know CW, if you're playing baseball, you're a designated hitter. You're missing a key tool, right? You, you can't field, you can only hit. That's the same thing. It, it's really, and you say, well, I can go to FT8 instead. Well, uh, maybe. There are some issues here. Uh, it's an option, certainly an option if nothing else works, but it's very slow. You're only working at best 20 an hour. Uh, on CW, I can easily do 50 an hour if, if the stations are there, right? Um, and then you can't give your park number. Right? You're going to give you grid square. You, you start start trying to put a park number instead of grid square, the things are going to get all fouled up, and you're going to go over your 13 characters. It's going to be a mess. Some people try to send an extra line after the CQ and just put the park number in it, but people may not read that, you know, because it's not directed to them. Uh, so you have to end up spotting yourself profusely so people know where you are and whatever. And if you're going to use FT8, don't do what I always do. I forget to bring the cable. I have the computer. I have the radio. I don't have the cable. It goes between the two. Happens a lot. So, um, yeah, I've used it. I used it. I did a night operation. And after about midnight, I was tired. I was tired of running a pileup all night on 40 meters. I just stuck it on FT8. And 
had something to eat and was relaxing. You know, all you need to do is go there and just click the, uh, the enter key every two minutes and <laughs> log somebody. I don't have to pay much attention to it. I've actually gotten good naps in doing that stuff. But, you know, you don't want that to be your primary mode. It's, it's, it's a good backup when things go wrong. So what about field day? Because we mentioned field day. Field day is only coming up in, a, in another two months. Right? I, I realize I have to start sending out things saying, hey, who's coming to field day? Who's not coming? You know, you get, it's a big job just getting. Field day is like herding cats. You've got to get everyone together in one place at the same time. It, it ain't easy if you've never done this. You know it. So everything we've mentioned here so far also applies to field day. You, uh, you don't need to be in a listed park. You can be anywhere at field day. Uh, you can be at a public location, a mall, town square, city park, whatever. Now, if you're in a public place, you need a security team. You need to watch your stuff because there's all sorts of people that just do weird things. So you have to be on top of that. Uh, you can be in a field somewhere or in the woods somewhere. That works. If you're in the woods or a field, then, then you don't deal with the two-legged critters. You deal with the multiple-legged critters that like to bite into you. So that's a problem. Or you can be in someone's backyard that doesn't have any antenna set up and just, just go there. And this is where me and the league go divergent directions quite loudly. Field day should be about not being at home. Screw that crap. You know, they're giving all this stuff where uh, they're making, allowing the Class D stations, which is the home station, to do this. To, no, get your ass out of your bedroom and go out to a site. Well, I'm in a wheelchair. Yeah, we've had people in wheelchairs at our field day site. Not a problem. Get out of the house. I mean, that's really, really the thing. It, it, yeah, there's some people just can't. Okay, I understand that, but most people can, and they just choose not to. Well, there's too many mosquitoes. I say, well, you know, deal with it. Um, but yeah, it, it should be away from home. And you know, the, the field day operations that uh, shut down at nine o'clock and go home. Please. <laughs> You know, the whole idea, it's about, it's supposed to be emergency communications, and in an emergency, you don't go home at 9 o'clock. You stay there until the emergency is resolved, right? So that's the difference. Field day is a 24-hour operation, and a park activation is only for a few hours. Now, the logistics starts to pile up on you. First off, you need to plan for at least three meals in 24 hours. Probably more than that, and having proper clothing, because even uh, uh, you're in June, whatever, um, where I live, it can get downright cold at night, you know, 40 degrees, that kind of crap going on. And it can easily be uh, 85 during the day and 40 at night. We've had weather like that. So you, you better have some stuff laying around the back of the car that you have to plan for. And always put your stuff in a shelter. In 24 hours, it's going to be doing something outside that you're not going to like for your equipment. Just have it, or people set up outside. Well, if it gets bad, we move it into the tent. Well, now you've got to take an operating station, take it off the air, carry it over. Who needs that aggravation? Just put it in the tent in the first place or anything. Just put it on something where you keep the environment kind of out of it. Field day does include a complex scoring system. So you've got to count the number of QSOs. Uh, if it's on phone or CW or digital, there's certain multipliers you got. Uh, you got all these various bonus things uh, for public involvement. I, I, they just changed the rules now. We used to just put a press release in there inviting people to field day. Now we actually have to drag somebody from a newspaper to the field day site to get the bonus points. Yeah, good luck for that. You know, well, you, what do you want me to go to the swamp to take pictures of you guys talking on a radio? You know, yeah, that's what we got to deal with. Uh, and of course, your logs go to the ARRL, not to the various uh, park groups. So th this is what we start with field day. This is an overhead shot of how we set up our our site. And we get, we got three stations. We got a phone station way up here. We got a CW station here. We got the get on the air station and the VHF station way down this end. And we show where the antennas are. And we're along this road here. And we got trees in certain spots where the dipoles go. We have fields in the other spots. And this this is how we, we plan this thing. Um, this is what it looks like. This is an older picture when we had everything, uh, we, had, we had a fourth tower. So this would be our CW tower. These are military masts that you put up by not having to climb them. So they, they come up from the ground. This is our CW guy. This was a, we had a 15 meter monobander up here. And this is a six meters and a tribander. And we got, got an old military tent. So 
Why are you using that? That's old. I see it, but it's roomy. <laughs> it's a lot of room, and it's a lot cooler than a nylon tent. So uh, even though it's kind of a pain to put up, it it, it really works. You know, that, that's the thing too. New tents are garbage. We we have a, a lot of old cloth tents which are a lot more comfortable to live in because you literally are living in the tent for 24 hours. This is our CW station. So. My God, look at all that stuff. It's more complicated than I have at home. Yes, it is. Uh, we actually have a running station and a calling station. One guy CQs, the other guy looks for, looks for other people on other bands and whatever. So each one has a computer. Uh, I think this computer here is the network that ties them between. I mean, I don't know what they have going on there. It takes them forever in a day to set up. And sometimes it even works. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, you call it wireless. But look at all the wires here and what's going on. I don't get involved with these guys. CW guys are, you know, different breed, whatever. Uh, this is the phone station, which is a lot more laid back. So this is our, our main transmitter. That's our, that's our backup uh, for listening on other bands, whatever. Each one has their own computer uh, and the fan, which is the most important thing because that, A, keeps you cool and basically grounds the winged air force that wants to take pot shots at you. Because a mosquito tries to fly across that fan, and he ain't going to make it. He gets plastered up against the back wall of the tent. Uh, nice little classic field day picture. The, this was the old CW station. This thing here on top, that's a flashing red beacon to keep airplanes away. He says, well, does it really keep the airplanes away? He says, airplane has never hit our CW tower since we've been doing it, so I guess it works, right? I mean, that, that is 60 feet in the air, so I mean, I guess it's possible. So when you get on the air, before, before you get on the air, uh, announce your activation on media. You know, go to the different park activation sites, let them know you're going to be there. Uh, you know, field day, whatever. Uh, the field day, now they want you to go on Facebook and talk about it. And you really got to be calling CQ. It's something we stress with our beginners at field day, too. It's, they can't find you if you're going hiding out, running around the band. Call CQ, make a lot of noise, they'll eventually find you. And... Cover the band with the largest footprint. So if you just sit on 20 meters, as a lot of people do in, in these activations, you are basically discriminating against certain members of the population. Oh, we don't want to say that. You can't say that word. Well, you are doing that. If you're on 20 meters, there's a 600-mile skip zone. Here's the reality. It means if you're on 20 meters from where I am in Vermont, everyone between where I am in Vermont, including this place, you ain't going to hear me on 20 meters from down here, all the way out to Dayton, Ohio. I know Dayton, Ohio is the first skip zone because when I go out to Hamvention, I can talk back to Vermont. If I'm in Cleveland or Columbus, can't. In the other direction, uh, Prince Edward Island, I think it's about 600 miles, whatever. Everyone in that circle, they're out of the running. They can't talk to you. You basically tell them, you don't count. And, and that's kind of not right to do that. Uh, so you go, you go on 40 meters. 40 meters doesn't have much of a skip zone. That, that, that number is 0 to 600 is, is on a good day. Often the skip zone on 40 is sometimes 150 to 200 miles. I have trouble hearing people in Connecticut on, on 40 meters sometimes. So they say, well, why don't you go to 80 meters? The problem with 80 meters is they, the antenna's got to be you know, pretty long. And like nobody goes there during the day. So uh, we don't do it. So you know, we just say, keep listening on 40. Eventually, we'll come up out of the noise. We'll work in bang, bang. But you really got to be on those two bands. The other band's not so important. 17 meters, not, not that many people there on phone, whatever. Um, you know, people tell me that, but the 40 and 20 are the ones that are always going to give you the most number of contacts, and, and that's what you're looking for. You want people to work you. Uh, spot yourself profusely on the cluster. Don't, don't be a pain, though. Don't spot yourself every five minutes. People get annoyed by that. You know, Essentially, every hour and every time you do a band or mode change is what we usually say. And have a way to do this. You know, um, I couldn't do it. I was in a park in the middle of nowhere in Vermont. Uh, there were no repeaters. There was no internet. There was no phones. There was no nothing. If I was in trouble, I had to go call CQ on 20 meters to help. I can't talk to anybody. No phones there. Um, real, real uh, you know, you, you think you're in like <laughs> the middle of nowhere. And, and, you know, you're only maybe 20 miles from the state capitol. Uh, kind of weird stuff. Uh, so, yeah, you want to make sure you have a way of getting spotted. So when you give your call sign, give your call sign phonetically. And the, the rule is if... 
give you call sign phonetically or not at all. If I say W1SJ, 33% of the time people get it right and think the S is a Sierra, but 66% uh, of the time they're going to either say F is in Foxtrot or X is in X-ray. You can't hear the difference on a radio. So give it phonetically and give it slowly. Uh, the, the new guys operate at field day with us. Uh, we use W1NVT. W1NVT, W1NVT. Don't do that. He says, it's not a race. I says, give your call sign slowly, and, and the, we use the word voice of God. W1 November, Victor, Tango. I mean, you make the place reverberate, whatever. And then they hear you. But if you give it really fast or you, you run those, those words together, they're not going to hear you. Remember, it's not a telephone. It's sideband. There's interference and all that other stuff. That really counts. I mean, then you'll get answers to the CQ. If you go too fast, you don't. Um, if you're on the park, some guys are in, uh, they're in a park and they want to work me, and I'm in the park. So instead of giving them their call sign, which is a smart thing to do, they say, park to park, park to park. How many have heard that before? Right? Park to park. I don't care. Just work me. If you're in a park, give me a number, and I'll write it down. Great, I'll get credit for it. You say park to park, it's meaningless. I can't put that in my log. <laughs> it doesn't know what it is. It's PA. It's, what is that? Is that Netherlands? You know, it, the program doesn't know. Just give me the call sign. And even after they say give me the call sign, they still say park to park. It's like the QRP. is All they say is QRP, QRP. I says, I don't care how much power you're running. I just want to know your call sign. <laughs> that's between you and whoever, you know. But, yeah, that's important. Call signs, that's the only way I can log you. So uh, make sure you do that. Um, have enough operators to allow for breaks. So we do a park activation with two people, and we have two bands. We can't really take much in the way of a break. You know, it's good to just get out, walk around the park a little bit, have something to eat. If we don't have too many people, you're kind of uh, stuck operating. Not really stuck operating, but you know you want you don't want to leave a station empty. Uh, take pictures and movies, document your fun. You know, put them up on uh, whatever media you like doing it. You know, we usually do a little thing and we put it up on YouTube. So can, you know, if you look up, uh, let's see, Bob's thing is Sandy. If you go to YouTube and look for Sandy 149's channel, um, you'll see all our park activation. They're basically the same thing. You see us shooting trees, putting up antennas, and calling CQ. So in the aftermath, post the story and the pictures on the Facebook sites, whatever. Uh, post it to your local club site. Upload the logs, the logbook of the world. And also to the various groups that run the Parks on the Air programs. Because if you don't do that, the other guys don't get credit for it. So they, they get mad at you. So, you know, you want to do that. Uh, you need to ask people help because it's not very obvious how to do that. They, uh, they don't do it right or whatever. I, I don't know. You have to put certain things in there. And then plan your next activation. So yeah, we do maybe all four or five activations a year. So it's like basically what weekends we're all going to be around in the summer. We can go somewhere. Um, other guys, every weekend, they're going somewhere. You know, they, they get 10,000 activations. People are into that stuff. We're not. We're into just once in a while going out and having a good time. So uh, questions? Nah. Night band. No, it's only, well, yeah, it's four or five channels. It's only it's actually four because one of the channels is almost all FT8 now. Um, during the day, you're not going to find anybody there. And at night, it can get pretty busy, but not so much on phone and CW. It's mostly FT8 gets busy there. So you ever say, well, try 80, try 60. Yeah, I know the band will work, but... People have to be there, though, and, and it's not really wide, widely adapted. So uh, 40 and 20 is your best bet. Uh, I have done 30 meters sometimes. 30 is all CW, though. Okay, so, I mean, that, that does work for me, but you, you have to be able to do that, which is why having a multi-band antenna where you can go different bands is, is pretty important. You, you have that option. And I, I may try it for a few minutes, whatever, and see uh, working a few people. I did it in, in one one park activation where I went there and I was working a whole bunch of guys from Europe. Well, yeah, I'm, the last park activation we did was last year, and uh, it just seemed like during the summer every week, every weekend, 20 meters was just not there. It it was 20 meters at COVID, and it just was not working right. Uh, the only people who I could work was guys in Foreland, 
wouldn't even hear the West Coast, and I'd hear Europe, but very weak. I'd go on CW. They'd be all on CW. I'd work a lot of them on CW, so that's what I had to do. 40 I could do on phone, so I had to do, you know, I'm ready to do a lot of different things, but I had to do the things to put contacts in the log. That's ultimately what you're doing in, in a contest-style operation. Any other questions? So you guys all set to do field day? You guys have a place to go? No? Yes? I don't know what we're going to do. Great, great, great. Well, you guys set up a big thing, right? Yeah. What, what's what's the call you use there? Great, great, great. Yeah, what call do you use? I know I've worked you guys uh, on, on the air. Yeah, I mean, I mean, get with your club, and if your club is a bunch of old fuddy duddies, as a lot of them are, uh, then then you need to be the spark plug. Because I talk to friends, ah, we didn't feel like going at everyone's, don't, no one wants to do it. It's too much work. Um, if it's too much work, then use your brain about how to make it more fun and less work, and that does take a bit of planning. So we we've throttled certain things down and hopped up other things to make them work better. Um, because, yeah, we, we're dealing in our field day group, our average age was 63, all uh, right? And, of course, that, who's got a bad arm, who's got a bad leg and whatever, and we're putting up towers. So you, you got to plan that business really carefully now. I don't know what happens in 20 years. You know, I'd probably still do this more all in their 80s. God, I hope not. But, um, yeah, uh, that's the thing. Or just go to a school and kidnap all the kids and put them on a bus. No, don't, I didn't say that. <laughs> but yeah, we, we got to get, uh, and you know what, kids would love field day. You, you know, it's not, not a matter of talking to people, it's a matter of, look, we got to put all this stuff up, we got to do all this, all this stuff we can do, right? We just got to get them acclimated to doing this stuff, and uh, that's where we fall down on, unfortunately. We, you know, every forum talks about that, there's nothing new there, but that's really what, what it ends up being is... Uh, yeah, but saying it is saying it's great. You know, you understand what the problem is. Now you got to actually do something about it, and nobody does much about it, unfortunately. Because let's face it, kid doesn't want to talk to a bunch of old guys. <laughs> do you want to talk to old guys? You don't know. You're confused. Okay, he he'll make a good ham. But but yeah, I mean, really, you know, it's um, it's kind of tough that way, but. Getting kids to a park activation and getting them involved in putting up the antenna and doing some of the work. And, oh, this is fun. We get to shoot the trees. Oh, yeah, let's do more of that. You know, that, that sort of stuff. That's where they get into, you know, get, get, getting them on the local repeater. Where everyone says, well, fine business, not much going on here. They, they don't want to hear that. That's not, not interesting. Anyone else about doing anything? Well, thank you very much for coming out. I hope you enjoyed Nearfest, and we'll do it again all next spring or next fall.